Welcome to the Rocket Shop Do It Yourself video, teaching you, you how to build your own Ford 9 inch end, rear end for your G body hot rod. If you're like me, you have a Malibu or Cutlass that you're just expecting the original 7.5 rear end to explode any time. Before I get into it, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Brian Taylor. I live and work near Nelford, Saskatchewan. I'm a regular on the forums Speed Talk and MalibuRacing.com and go by the name Prairie Hot Rodder. I love God and I like cars. I use my blog and my skills to share my faith. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. Well, Hot Rodders love straight paths. Let's build this diff together. First thing you need is a 9 inch Ford core differential to start with. This is a diff that has already been stripped down, all the pieces and parts taken out of it. It's out of a mid 70s Ford half ton. I like to use the truck diffs because they have the least amount of junk welded on them. All this stuff will be, have to be cut off. The spring perches, the shock mounts, and I'll clean this up and turn this greasy old thing into a race car diff that you can be proud of. So let's get started. The first thing I'm going to do is cut these mounts off. As you can see, I've used the cutting torch to cut off these old brackets. These were the leaf springs and the shock mounts. Those all need to be cut off and cut them off as close to the tubes as you can without gouging up the tubes. If you gouge up the tubes, that's just more work that you're going to have to do later. Now, the most tedious job is to grind all these smooth. Uh, big angle grinder, and just go slow and careful and grind it all down flush with the tubes. You don't want to grind any divots in the tubes, just nice and smooth and flush. Then. After that, we can wash this housing down, get rid of all the grinding uh, steel and the mud and dust and dirt and grease and prepare for the next step. Okay, there's what it looks like once that bracket is cut off and ground smooth. As you can see, I grinded it all away as good as I could and smoothed it out with the power buffer. Here's where the uh, shock mount was. As you can see, I made a gouge there with the torch. Any time that happens, all you do is you clean the gouge out so there's no junk in it. Another little one there, and weld it up and grind it smooth. You want this thing to look as good as possible. When you have this under the back of your race car, you want to be proud of it and say that you built it yourself. Now I have my housing all cleaned up as far as the welds ground down, the old brackets cut off. Now I'm ready to, for the next step. And the next step is to straighten the housing. Every one of these housings is bent. They've had a tough life. They've bounced around down back roads and hit potholes. I actually found a crack in my housing, which is a reminder to check your housing really well. Mine had a crack right there. If that happens, grind the crack open and weld it up. Now to straighten my housing, the best way to do this would be with a bench press. Since I don't have one, I'm going to show you how to do it without it. And to check your housing for straightness, you need some type of tool. As you see here, I've got a four nine inch center chunk with this, uh, I had this piece machined to put inside of it that fits in here tightly. I'm going to bolt this center piece into this housing. And then I'm going to slide this piece of bar through the whole thing and it will be perfectly in line and I'll be able to see on the tube ends how much the housing is bent. So I'm going to bolt this in with four bolts, make sure this area is clean, all the old gasket, all the old silicone gone off there so this bolts in nice and tight. And we'll check it for straightness and then we'll straighten it out. There my bar is through there and as you can see it's bent. You can see the tightness of the, my fingers on this side 
versus this side. The tubes are bent down, so I need to pull those tubes up. Come around to the other side. They're both straight as far as front to back in the vehicle. This one's also bent a little bit the same way as the other one. So I need both these tubes to go up probably. This one isn't too bad actually. This one maybe, this one's pretty good actually. The other side maybe has to go up about an eighth of an inch or so. So now I'm going to get out my tube axle tube straightening rig and show you how it works. There you have my housing straightening setup. All it is is a chain and a bottle jack and a piece of tubing on top of the jack and you jack up on the jack and it brings the tubing, the axle tube ends up to where they're supposed to be. You have to go a little bit past so that when you let off the pressure the spring back doesn't go back to where they were to begin with. Make sure you got a strong enough chain. Don't get yourself in line with the chain in case the chain ever broke. It looks pretty Fred Flintstone, but it works. As you noticed my jig kind of pulls on them both at the same time. If you want to straighten out one tube and leave the other one alone, all you do is you set it up the same way it is, put some pressure on it, and if you need to bend just this tube, you want to hit it with a sledgehammer right here Use a block of wood, whatever you got to do, or possibly put some heat on this with your cutting torch, and then this one will bend separate from that one, and vice versa. As long as you get it inside of an eighth of an inch, so it's not more than an eighth of an inch out of center, that's good enough. You'll be cutting these off, and the closer you go this way, the less out it becomes. So we're going to be cutting off three or four inches off the ends of these tubes, and any distance that we're out will be decreased the farther that we cut it off inside of here. And our new tube ends will be put on using this centering tool. So even if the tube is off one way or the other a little bit, the ends will still be on in the right place. So now we'll get it into the jig to find out where we're going to make our cuts with the saw. The next thing to talk about is the jig. You need a way of transferring all the mounting points off your original 7.5 inch rear end to your new 9 inch. You need uh, somewhere to show you the length of the whole diff. You need somewhere to show you where to bolt on, or weld on the lower control arm mounts. This is where the shock hole bolts in and this is where the um, control arm bolts on. You need somewhere to show you where the uh, spring pockets go. You need somewhere to show you where the upper control arms mount on both sides and you need somewhere something to register off the pinion so that you can get that diff in there the right way. All those things don't go on on center. The pinion is actually offset a little bit. So you need your jig to register off the pinion so that when you put the new housing in the jig, it's correctly offset the way that it's supposed to be, just like the original diff was in the car. This jig might look intimidating, but it's not too hard. All you need to do is have your original seven and a half inch rear end, get yourself a nice big chunk of tubing that you know isn't gonna warp or bend, this is like 5 by 5 by 3 16 wall. And put some brackets to hold your diff in the right spot. Make sure it's sitting up there level and even so it's sitting right where you want it to be. And then build connection points to all the control arm mounts, spring perches, and the overall width of the diff. So I'll get this new rear end into there and I'll show you how it works. As you can see I have this 
locating tool. It just slides into this little piece of tubing that I got there. I shove it in until it goes into the yoke of the diff. And then I move the diff back and forth to get it dead on centered on this piece of tubing. Then I clamp it on so it can't move. And then I'll put a plate on these tabs that will clamp on and show me exactly the width that this diff needs to be. This isn't too high tech. You can build this yourself. Next thing you're going to do is mark it where it needs to be cut. So registering off my angle iron down here, I clamp on another piece of angle iron at 90 degrees, brings it up to here. What you want to do is mark it with a sharpie or scribe a line. That's not exactly where you're going to be cutting but that's the exact width of the tubing or of the original rear end. We're going to have to cut even more than that off because we have to make room for our housing end. So I'll mark this side, I'll mark that side and our housing ends, I'm using Strange Engineering H1143 housing ends which are 1.3 inches long so after I make this line I mark off another 1.3 inches and then make another line and that's where I'll cut with my bandsaw. There's my marks where I'll be cutting. On some housings that are uh, narrower to begin with you actually have to cut the tube end off first with a torch or a plasma cutter or a sawzall just so you can get this out of the way so that it will go into your good bandsaw properly. On the narrower housings like this Ford half ton 72 and older, that's what you got to do. Your cut is so close up here that you actually got to cut this off first and get it out of the way so it doesn't interfere with your saw table. But on these uh, wider housings, that's not a problem. This all sticks out past the blade lots and the table lots far enough. So there's my new mark. There's the, there's the width mark of the housing. And there's where I'm going to be cutting it off because of my new housing end, which is right there, is that wide 1.3 inches. That'll be going on there and taking up that space. So I got both ends marked and I'm getting ready to put it into the saw. It's just a cheap Chinese little band saw. It does the job just fine. Make sure you get the blade square into the, into the table and hold the back end of the housing up so that it's laying flat on the table and it takes probably 10 minutes to make each cut. It just cuts slow but and if you set it up properly it can make nice straight cuts. Here's my diff in my saw ready to start cutting. I've leveled the diff as best as I can. I got it laying flat on the table. I got it clamped in tight. I got the blade on the mark. This is where, say if you wanted to narrow the diff half an inch more than stock, you could without much of a problem. I wouldn't go much more than maybe an inch at maximum because the housing ends that you put on will start to come into contact with the lower control arm mounts if you're using all the stock suspension mounting points. This video is about making a stock dimension 9 inch for a G body. So if you want to get into fancier diffs, that's kind of a different story. And as you can see also, this end of the diff, I cut a lot less off than this end. This end gets quite a bit more cut off of it. That's because of the way the housing goes in the jig. I'll have one long axle and one narrow axle or shorter axle I should say. So let's get this cut started. While that's cutting, I'll show you what to do for the next step. Here's my lower control arm mounts. These are just stock ones off my stock seven and a half inch rear end. I cut them off with my plasma cutter as close to the tube as I can. Now what I wanna do is bolt these in to my jig.
So I'll take these bolts out. It's kind of tough to do with one hand and hold the camera. So this bolts in just like so. There, I have my lower control arms bolted into my jig. This bolt doesn't need to be tight, but this one should be. That holds it nice and solid. Now I use my alignment tool again, and I roll it inside of these mounts, and it shows me where I need to grind to get these lower control arm brackets clearanced for my housing. So this is kind of a tedious job, rolling this up like this and back and forth like this on both ends at the same time and use a marker and mark these spots wherever it touches and you want to grind that out with a die grinder or an angle grinder and if you have to make some bigger cuts with a plasma cutter that's fine so that the housing is going to drop right in there without, without these actually holding the housing up out of these standoffs. So clearance these, grind away all the slag and junk. It's a little bit tedious and slow, but uh, anyone can do it. Just take your time and do your best. After half an hour of grinding and checking and grinding, this here fits in here. Um, if there's any big gaps that you can't weld, you're gonna have to put a little bit of metal back in, a piece of rod or something, fill up the gap, make nice welds. Um, it's important that the diff it, housing is sitting back all the way down in the mounts to where it was before. Um, and that can depend on the size of these tubes as well. Some diffs have bigger tubes than the others. I think this is probably a three inch. Some of the vans have three and a half inch and uh, cars often have like two and three quarter inch, I think. So a two and three quarter inch one is gonna be sitting right down in my mounts right on the bottom, whereas a three and a half inch one is gonna be held up a little bit. So you have to take that into account when you do your grinding. So as you can see, I've done a little bit of marking with a marker, a little bit of grinding, finding the tight spots, grinding away the metal, getting it to sit right down where it's supposed to be. I got my tool back in here, holding the diff right where it's supposed to be. When you're at this point, you should have the equal amount of tubing sticking past the mount on both ends, here and here. Uh, when this diff is done with the new housing ends on it, the overall width should be right around 52 and 3 eighths. Somewhere in between 52 and a quarter and 52 and 3 eighths. That's kind of the range. Even the factory diffs are off and out a little bit. So now I'll go ahead and tack weld these in about four places. And then I'll take the diff back out of the jig, set it on my little welding table here and then I can flip it upside down and make nice welds all the way around those tube ends or those uh, brackets and then once those are welded on then I can position my spring perches and my upper control arm mounts up on top of the housing up here There we go. Lower control arm brackets welded on. Do a nice weld. Get some, make sure your welder's hot enough. Um, it doesn't matter if you, you, you don't want to put too light of a weld there. Some people might say you'll warp the housing or warp the tubing. Just remember your housing end is going to be put on with the jig. So even if this is this way or this way, the tube end is still going to be on in the right place. If you end up with too big a gap, like I did 
on these ends here I will just use my saw and cut that off in a straight line there so that's not even showing same with this end cut this off right here just straight up there you can fill that if you want but it'll just take some work and it probably won't look the nicest when it's done there's that weld now I'm ready to move on to the next thing put this back in the jig and put the rest of the mounts on okay the next part of this job is to install the upper control arm mounts as you can see I get these pieces laser cut at a local place that has a laser uh, the very first one of these diffs that I made I just cut these out with a jigsaw actually with a hacksaw type blade in it but you can use a cutting torch or plasma cut these out make templates out of cardboard and then transfer them to steel once you're happy with it, where they are going to be placed. As you can see, there's one taller and one shorter one. You need to cut pieces of tubing to go in here that will accept your bushings. Here's what they look like when they're done. As you can see, there's a piece of tubing in there. I cut this tubing one and a quarter inches long. That way, with this quarter inch steel in the middle, there's half an inch sticking out each side. I clamp this onto a table, put the <clears throat> bushing in there, press it in, and you gotta have these completely done before you weld them onto there, because this is gonna fit inside your jig. And the tubing, you actually have to grind the weld out of it, because the way they roll the tubing, there's a little weld in the middle. You have to grind that away so that your bushing presses in properly. So using these completed ones, I'm going to show you how to put the upper control arm mounts on. Okay, here's our jig for the upper control arm mounts. Not too high tech. All it is is a way of holding the mounts in the factory positions and the right distance apart. You can mock this all up when you originally build your jig. So as you can see, it fits into those notches there. And you can see that the taller mount goes on this side and the shorter one goes on this side. And they slope towards the back. So I'll put this in here. That. This one in here like this. And then hold that nice and square. Lower these down. And as you can see, they hang out over the edge. That's fine. We'll deal with that when we get to that point. I just want to make sure that they're in there right in the stock distance, the same distance apart as the factory ones on the stock rear end. Okay, those are tacked on. Get my jig out of the way. Put a nice weld on those. spring perches. I also get laser cut spring perches. I weld a piece of tubing into the middle of them. Your spring sits on top of there and I have a little tool for mounting them as well. This here goes in here like this. Doesn't need to drop in very far just to basically hold it in the right position. It goes into this. Puts that spring perch in the right place that off and then I weld a little brace to the back edge of it because it overhangs off the tubing quite a ways. Just a little piece of quarter by one works just fine. The excess that's hanging off of here, what we're actually going to do is heat this up, fold it over and weld it on. Mm -hmm. 
That gives that mount a little bit of extra strength. This extra that's hanging off this one, I will just trim off, weld a little bit underneath of it, and then trim off any excess or grind it off. As you can see, there's a bit of a gap here. I'm gonna have to put a little piece of rod in there to fill that up and make it look pretty. And then after we're done this, we'll move on to the housing end. So those are the last thing that you put on. The last thing to do of any serious importance is to put these housing ends on. As you can see, they just have a flat surface there that's gonna butt up to there and weld on. So to get a, the best weld possible, what we're gonna do is grind a taper onto this. So we'll grind about halfway through the tubing at a 45 degree angle or close to it so that we have a little trough for our weld to go into when we weld that tubing end or that axle tube end on. So I'll put my bar back through there. I have a tool to fit into this snugly so this will slide onto the bar. When that notch is, or that trough is cut there, it will slide on there like that and weld it on. As you can see, I have this tool here that fits snugly on into the inside of the new housing end. And, it, and then I clamp it on with these two vice grips, slide it on the shaft that goes all the way through, tack weld it on, and as you, as you can see, I have a nice little trough there to put my weld in. And weld that all the way around. I'm not quite talented enough to weld it all the way around in one continuous weld, but I'll put four or five welds couple inches long all the way around and make sure that each one overlaps the next one. I don't want any leaks here and I want my welder turned up nice and hot to get some good penetration into that weld. So I'll do this end and then that end and then I'll be ready to wrap this up. There's one weld done, nice and even. Having that trough there really makes the weld lay in a nice puddle. This is all just done with the plain MIG welder. And as you can see, there's my tool there. There's the bevel that that housing end rests on and holds it in the right position. Now I just gotta do the other end. Okay, we're just ready to wrap this up. I'm gonna show you how to measure for axle length. You're gonna have to order axles for this diff. So what I've done is clamp a piece of angle iron to the end of here, so it's perpendicular to the tube. And what the axle company is going to want to know is the measurement from there over to the center of the pinion. And on this one is 25 and 9 16 That's the passenger side axle length. And we do the same thing over here. solvent, prime it, and paint it, and this baby will be ready to hit the road and get built into a nice diff. Hopefully you've enjoyed my video and I don't know if I've convinced you to build your own diff or to go ahead and buy one from someone that builds them. Either way, there's a feeling of satisfaction in doing it yourself 
or now you can see the amount of work that goes into one. And you might think those ones you buy from Strange or Moser or Curry or any of those other manufacturers are well worth what you pay. So thanks again. My name is Brian Taylor and check out my blog at therocketshop.blogspot.com and God bless.